Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> Good to see all of you IRL. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Joshua Citarella. I'm an artist and internet culture researcher. The piece we're looking at here on the screen is called SWIM, S-W-I-M, Someone Who Isn't Me. It's an internet acronym. And this is depicting an anarcho-capitalist future inspired by doomsday prepper visions of the future, scraped from communities on Reddit, Discord, 4chan, uh, many other similar platforms. This is around 12 feet. This is 8 by 12 feet. It's a life-size piece. You can see every eyelash on the eye. And figuring out those logistical problems and mapping them in a 2D life-size space makes you very, very intimately familiar with how people are planning for the apocalypse. I am also a content creator. I think many people may know me from the podcast or from newsletters or from videos or live streams. I've actually live streamed for over 700 hours. I looked before I did this talk. That is a, that's a lot of time. So uh, it's a lot of primary source material that I'm reviewing and I'll be talking about tonight. Podcast guests include Taylor Lorenz, who spoke earlier this morning, as well as Yancey Strickler, who was the guest uh, last week talking about MetaLabel. I think many people here will be familiar with that. And uh, maybe important to mention that this meme is made by a follower, a listener of the podcast, and all the stuff that I show today will, um, they're images that are found online. So unless I specify other words, it's not an artwork that I've made, it's a piece of internet culture that I'm holding up for everyone here to reflect on. And this project began when I wrote a book in 2018 called Politogram and the Post Left. This is an ethnography of a very specific mimetic subculture, which at the time included teenagers between the ages of 12 and 17, who were interested in all forms of left-wing politics, and then over the course of a few years, radicalized into something uh, much darker. Post-left, as it was known at the time, Luddism, uh, eco-anarchy, green anarchy, it goes by a number of names, civilization critique, anti-civilization. Uh, the terminology becomes in, infinitely nicheified. When I brought this work to different institutions within the art world, uh, no one was interested to pay for it and no one was interested to publish it, even for free. So <laughs> what I did was I uh, decided to bypass all the gatekeepers and bring my work to crowdfunding and it just so turns out that there were a lot of people who were interested in it and this project has shaped my practice ever since. This book was intended to be a guidebook for people who are curious about these communities but are unsure where to start. Uh, as soon as it was released, probably within the first week, someone from these communities got a hold of a physical copy, scanned it, uploaded it to Discord, and then my entire practice has changed ever since where I'm now in touch with all of these people all the time. And while we're told that the internet is something like this, this kind of happy-go-lucky, onwards and upwards, young people freely navigating these spaces, uh, my inclination is that the internet resembles something much more like this. If you can't read the screen, I'll just read it out for you. <laughs> Extreme political opinions detonated into a gaming Discord server filled with nine-year-olds. <laughs> this piece was actually, uh, excuse me, this meme this meme, uh, not an artwork, this meme was sent to me by one of the young teenagers profiled in that book. At the end of it, the reason why it was initially in print and not distributed online is because this group of radical teenagers, some of them too young to drive, literally 13 years old at the time, that was his experience, they're circulating manifestos from active eco-extremist groups that contain instructions for how to assemble improvised explosive devices. This is a level of extremism and radicality that is beyond the pale for any kind of civil discussion of politics and uh, really constituted something that I thought was novel and unprecedented in previous generations. My work has been cited and referenced in these publications. I don't necessarily think that's because my work on this topic is so good, but mostly because the media narrative in a lot of these publications is just so bad. People don't actually spend time with these communities. Uh, they haven't really spoken with meme makers. They haven't made them themselves. So I find myself here doing this work and uh, talking about these communities in a really in-depth, detailed way. I still make art. I'm showing in uh, half, a half a dozen different museum shows this year, Hong Kong, Italy, Germany, Poland, uh, several others. But alongside all of this, uh, I'm also working 
I'm one of the only people who is publishing primary source research on these topics outside of traditional institutions, think tanks, universities, and, and so on. Uh, so it turns out that the best way to learn about these people is just to talk to them. And I've spent the last few years doing exactly that. I've been doing interviews with people who have accounts that look like this. If you've spent, I think a lot of people here have spent time on social media, so you're familiar with a few of these characters. Tons of emojis in the bio, um, very niche ideologies, some of them seemingly contradictory. They don't feel like they should belong together, but here they are, jammed together in a very unusual way. Incredibly niche things that have, you know, in some cases a few hundred followers, but then they scale up to have content creators who have audiences numbering in the millions. These are, a few of these I think are really, really special. Actually, the AI-backed central planning paired with permanent revolution and an idea that state socialism could also be meritocracy. It's, they, you know, you, when you find the gems that are really crafted like this, you gotta, <laughs> you gotta take a screenshot along the way. Um, and there are many, many of these accounts. Um, it's almost impossible to put a number on the size of these communities. There are a few content creators, uh, specifically I think JREG uh, on YouTube is a good example of this, but you can have audiences in the millions for some of these. Some of those videos have reached uh, maybe close to the tens of millions, uh, slightly below 10 million views. And the people behind these accounts have real stories. They have complex lives. They are navigating a very strange period of internet culture and they're trying to make sense of the world. Uh, and I've tried to give them the space to understand that and understand their journey towards clarity in these spaces. The story I'd like to tell today begins with the second book I published on this topic. This is titled 20 Interviews. And at this time, I'm interviewing people who are between the ages of 15 to 22. I think it's mostly the same group of people, but they have proportionately aged upwards. The First book was 2018, this is in 2020, so it's the same demographic that got introduced to politics in the same period, and they've just aged up a few years in, in the meantime. And in this book, there are 10 interviews on the left, 10 on the right, and up, down, and sideways, really all over the place. You'll recognize the book cover, no doubt, as being the political compass. If you've managed to find your way here, you are undoubtedly familiar with this. But just to give the very briefest explanation, this is an XY graph. Uh, and we have on the x-axis the economic right, the economic left, uh, and then the y-axis authoritarian to libertarian. So doubling the resolution of political identities besides the two-party binary that we're used to in the United States. And for teenagers at this time, this is an immensely uh, explosive idea that there can be more resolution of political identities. We're looking here at a page out of the Rampart Journal of Individualist Thought. This is published in 1968, and I found this on the archive of the Mises Institute. If you are not familiar with the Mises Institute, this is a think tank and educational program deeply embedded in libertarian philosophies. Ludwig von Mises is the Austrian economist who wrote Economic Calculation in the Socialist Commonwealth, and this came out in 1920. It is widely considered the intellectual work within the Western canon that discredits the feasibility of economic planning aka that socialism sounds good on paper, but cannot work in practice. I would disagree with this, by the way, and I think Amazon does a lot to disrupt 20th century notions of price signals and, and so on, but that's a whole other podcast. The, the point of this is that these very silly memes are actually a rather sophisticated analytical tool. We're just looking at these two things overlaid. And uh, right now they're being used by shitposting teenagers, but they're actually engaging in some kind of exaggerated version of the important debates that shaped huge political economic outcomes in the 20th century. I'm gonna do a very brief genealogy of how this meme format evolved and where we are now. We're looking here at two compasses. This is uh, on the left side called the Sapley political compass. You'll have the XY coordinates that you're familiar with. And we have on the uh, right side of it, we have a third axis, a Z axis, if you would, uh, measuring your cultural alignment. So from progressive to conservative. And this is offering yet another dimension of political identity. On the right side, we have, these are two side-by-side -side screenshots. We have eight values, which quickly became the community standard. And we have your familiar XY grid. We have a cultural axis. And then they've introduced a fourth axis called nation to world. Uh, these two screenshots are actually from the same user. 
Um, and, and they're maybe like a year, a year and a half apart as the different quizzes are trending at different time periods. But you're watching him through the captions kind of struggle with his own political identity and trying to map himself using all of these uh, numbers falling in different places between the different graphs. Following this, there is a massive, massive quiz. Um, all of these are, you know, there may be 50 multiple, multiple choice questions. This one, I think, is 150, so it's really, really extensive. And it has eight different axes. There's also room for negative space for uncertain answers within uh, all of the different multiple choice questions. You have on the lower side here different achievement badges like veganism or feminism or monarchy or Illuminati or things that don't neatly map onto these XY quadrants uh, that you need to have kind of denotated as like a little uh, in-game achievement badge or something. Importantly, Plutoscales has a really novel invention is that they generate a custom flag for you at the top of the quiz that has three main touchstones for what your political belief system is. On the left here we have work, liberty, and fatherland. Uh, and then there's a, a custom flag generated on top of that. And then on the opposite side, we have equality, socialism, and revolution. And these flags will become very influential later. Quickly, what happens is that the quiz format breaks apart. This is now too complex to compare yourself to others. And we, in, we enter this new stage of the role, play, the role playing game as labeling iconography and narrative. These are a few different iceberg memes that are far too detailed to read here, but uh, if you've come across them before, this is a near infinite list of political ideologies. Um, it's an incredible way to waste a whole bunch of time. These are two of my favorites, although there's a lot that have uh, circulated online. And we're looking here at a detailed version of this. This one in particular, I have actually streamed all of it. 26 hours on Twitch. I Wikipedia and Google searched every single one of these. Um, and, and people watched it. I don't know why, but uh, it, was, <laughs> it was painful for me. Maybe that's what was most uh, entertaining about it. Xenofeminism, actually, here towards the lower center. I've actually talked to Helen Hester. She was a guest on the podcast. So what exactly is going on here. There's a thriving youth subculture. There are content creators with followers in the millions. There are giant subreddits and super active discords. And there's a lot of people who should all hate each other, but they seem to be spending time in the exact same place, even if they're all debating and arguing all of the time. Social media has become a kind of massive multiplayer online role-playing game where teens try on and off new political identities like they are choosing their character in a video game. It's quite literally what we see here. You have a choose your character selection screen of different political alignments. And while there were always young radicals in every generation, this seems qualitatively different than periods in the past. Part of this is undoubtedly the Web2 internet, the attention economy driving strange behavior online, but another part of it is the real political crisis of today and the unresolved debates of the 20th century. In 1989, Francis Fukuyama published the infamous essay, The End of History, which put forward the idea that Western liberal democracy is the endpoint of mankind's ideological evolution and the final form of human government. The TLDR is that fascism was permanently discredited in the 1930s, communism fell along, alongside the collapse of the USSR in the 1980s, and of the three great ideologies of the 20th century, capitalism emerged victorious as the only viable political economic model for modernity. But today, numerous crises have placed increasing strain on the liberal democratic model. Market and institutional failures make headlines on a weekly basis. We now see populist movements on both the left and right. Fascism and socialism are once again up for debate, and so-called history has returned. <laughs> the Overton window closed in the 1980s, but now it has reopened. Fukuyama calling himself a social democrat nowadays, very interesting. So I've made it my practice to collect these uncommon political worldviews and to map this new territory. This is a piece of mine called Ideologies, E like email. Ideology is an internet slang term used to describe complex ideological labels. These hyper-specific categories serve as a gamified form of identity play and niche personal branding in the chaotic landscape of online politics. 
I'll read a few of these out here so you get the feel, the vibe of what these communities are creating. And we're starting from the upper left-hand side. This is left egoist transhumanism, followed by libertarian neo-monarchism and anarcho-primitivist caliphatism. And all of these begin as images found online. These are posts made in earnest. They're usually a status update accompanied by a long caption in a blog type format. And teenagers will print this out using print and demand services, ship it to their house, and they'll hang it in their bedroom like my generation would have the poster of a band. Some part of this is also attached to the collapse of the music industry, where uh, the devaluation of music has just thrust subculture into these niche political ideologies. Here they are in the 34th Ljubljana Biennial. This is a piece by Simon Denny in the corner here. Um, they, were they were actually <laughs> hung in the entryway to a government building, which is a kind of very, very bizarre place to find yourself in. But you know, art gets those unique spaces that are usually not allowed and in some cases illegal to place the flag of a uh, different nation or a different state uh, within your government buildings. This is Ideologies too. Um, I, I really like the format of the top eight, so I select these in groups of eight similar to the MySpace uh, infamous top eight format. It's like enough facets to describe who you are, um, but not too many aspects of your identity. It's a squad. Eight is a squad. You know, two is your friends, and then when it's 150, it's like your, your whole crew. But yeah, eight is like the right level of curation. And we have here queer transhumanist anarchism, progress pride constitutional monarchy, Anarcho-collectivist Islamo-minarchism. And uh, my favorite here, just I'm trying to be sensitive of time, but uh, on the bottom left here, we have the post-Brexit European Union, where <laughs> one, of the, one of the stars has been removed. This is by, this is by a shitposting teenager ma made it online, but it's important that like, there are way more countries in the EU than there are stars. The stars don't represent the country. They're like points of like, political alignment and values, but it's just very kind of intuitive in the graphic design sense, so I really appreciate that. Um, Ideologies 3, there are, there's a lot of these. This is an ongoing series, and as long as I'm interested in this space, I'll, I'll keep producing them. And Ideologies 4, um, extensive labels for all of these. This, has, this format has become a meme in itself now. There's a JavaScript. Uh, you can just generate new political ideologies. <laughs> this, uh, this slide is in my notes as nightmare blunt rotation. Uh, <laughs> So, so how much of this, how much of this is actually real, right? Like, are these people, <laughs> are they shit posting? Um, it's don't read too much, or you will get an aneurysm. It's uh, rather dangerous. It's hard to tell if people mean this in earnest, if they're using social media to find, you know, a, a political belief through this process of shit posting. It's an ironic hedge. Very often, um, there's an incredible tweet by one of these accounts that says. Quote, MAGA communism will bring the return of Pol Pot patriarchy to the United States. <laughs> you, guys are, you guys are doing great, by the way. Usually people tap out after posts left, but you made it all the way to Pol Pot patriarchy, so congratulations. <laughs> this, this group, actually, their political tactics are described as discursive terrorism, where they are inventing new political labels like red, yellow, Ron Paul Maoism, MAGA communism. <laughs> Um, which is this idea that the deindustrialized red states are analogous to the Maoist peasantry and the urban elites in blue states, you know, the, the cities are surrounded by the hills. So um, I've made it my practice to talk with these people and to understand their worldview. This is Zoomer as he goes uh, online. He's 19 years old. He lives in Tennessee. His pronouns are he, him. He previously identified as, as they, them. Uh, now he just uses the label uh, queer and, and he, him pronouns. He is a third positionist, which means economically left and extremely culturally conservative. There are significant implications with that of ethno-separatism, which I press him on in the podcast, but he does not uh, comment on. He pushes back against that. I think that is incorrect, but that's, that's his version of it. He is also a practicing Muslim. He is the child of immigrants from South Asia. And around age 13, Zoomer got into politics through Gamergate. 
He was very interested in owning the libs, in dunking on the SJWs. He had super strict parents, was not allowed to have social media, so he only had YouTube as his online outlet. And he starts watching political videos with people like Sargon of Akkad and Louder with Crowder, Milo Yiannopoulos, all of these types of characters in, in that era. Um, eventually, he is alienated, uh, especially by Steven Crowder, with all of the Islamophobic content that uh, uh, he encounters online, and he starts leaning much more libertarian, anarchist leading. He reads Joseph Proudhon. Um, his political views start to evolve. Um, he's still an anti-SJW middle schooler. Uh, he's living at this time a rather upper um, upper middle class life. His father is an entrepreneur. It's a very hardworking family, first generation immigrants. And then abruptly and very sadly, the father goes bankrupt. The businesses are not working out. The father leaves the family. The parents get divorced. They now have to switch schools and they move to a very low income neighborhood. And he's now, he's gone from this life of relative luxury to living uh, the very impoverished reality of a single mother with kids, um, which is the single data point for the greatest predictor of poverty in the United States. If you had one piece of information about people being a single mother with children, um, that is the single greatest indicator of poverty. So his new class circumstances make him very unclear about his political ideas. He also begins to realize he's a gay man. He doesn't feel at home in American conservatism anymore because those people dislike him for his sexual orientation, his religious affiliation. Uh, and he doesn't necessarily feel at home in libertarianism because he's living in pretty dire poverty now. All of those free market policies were pretty compatible when he was living a affluent life, but now he could really use a social safety net. So from Proudhon, he gets into Marx and he's devouring all of this left-wing content primarily via YouTube. Around that time, he gets onto Instagram and he starts posting about his political ideas. He's age 16. Unfortunately, during this period, the family falls on even harder times. There are no relatives in the US for them to fall back on. His family, Zoomer, his mom, and his younger sibling are now living out of their car. They are going to food pantries and soup kitchens for their meals. And his online lefty community that is always talking about mutual aid and helping the less fortunate and so on, these people are nowhere to be seen. There are no Marxists or communists at the food pantry. Instead, he meets conservative religious people doing this form of charity. In the end, the family's local mosque holds a fundraiser and collects a big donation to help rehouse them. The kids are in school, the mom is employed, and the donation helps them to afford rent in a new apartment. Around that time, he makes this post. The center, we see the Gadsden snake, which is uh, familiar from the libertarian flag, used to symbolize uh, you know, extreme individualism and self-sufficiently. But in this image, they are all bonded together. And in the upper right, we have red to signify collectivism. In the lower right, we have blue for minarchism. If you're not familiar with this, this is a very small government, sometimes called a night watchman state. And in his experience, this kind of makes sense because there was no state aid, there was no welfare or safety net that came to their help. Instead, it was a group of conservative religious people who all bonded together to take care of them. The text below here is written in uh, Arabic moon and sun, leather, sun letters. Um, it has been told to me, so this may not be a direct translation, but it says, don't step on us, which seems intuitive in this context. So this is why I think that these silly memes are important, because behind all of them is a complex and very human story of young people trying to make sense of the world in a moment of extreme political and social chaos. From here forward, Zoomer's politics are formed by this experience. And he has to square his life experience with his abstract political ideals. He begins to reinterpret his own identity and carve out a space for himself. Zoomer is now a passionate enthusiast of the Islamic Golden Age, which created some of the world's first examples of social security and welfare. These early social safety nets were administered by religious organizations rather than the state itself. This is actually a little discussed counter history that is popular among the MAGA communist people from a, a few slides ago and uh, rather extreme elements of the horseshoe left, you might call them. 
So he is economically on the left, but he is culturally on the right, and for him that makes some kind of sense. This is all part of a podcast that will come out later this month. It's a very edited down, anonymized version of Zoomer's story. Today, Zoomer works in a factory. I suspect that this is Amazon, although I'm not able to confirm that in the interview. And he helps to support his family, his mom, and younger sibling who is still in school. It's maybe important to say that a lot of these ideas are retconned and skewed to fit people's life experiences. In trying to make sense of the world, we all create lore, just like a role-playing game. It probably won't surprise you that Zoomer's hobbies include playing Dungeons and Dragons. His character is a dragonborn knight who battles an evil lich named Jeff Beelzebezos. <laughs> That's, at that point, the podcast really starts to make sense because he's, he's role-playing in both of the worlds and it, yeah, it checks out. Um, so my, my approach here is to take silly things seriously. These internet memes are responding to a real political crisis, and they make about as much sense as the world itself. I want to give an acknowledgement here to a great book by Peter Frege, which has always been a huge inspiration for me. And he has this kind of XY grid that's laid out in the book um, with four competing visions of the future. So imagine, if you will, that the NPC character is in the center of the graph. This is the, the crisis of the 20th century, these unresolved questions of political economy. And then there are four characters surrounding it that are all competing with their own vision for the future. Um, you know, it's important in those choose your character screens, there's no NPC. You can't choose to play as the neoliberal center. You can only choose from the extremes. And all those are offering a different vision of the future, a different solution for what is, what is happening, this crisis at the center of politics. Young people are mining history and political theory through meme formats to sandbox a new kind of politics. They are looking for something novel and unconventional that can scale to the size of the crises of the 21st century. So I have asked them to do pretty much exactly that. This is a piece I first showed at KW Institute of Contemporary Art in Berlin. Each of these, is a, uh, each of these works is accompanied by a radio play that sketches a new political vision of the future. They are written by teenage meme posters, and then that story is read by podcasters, some of which I think you'll be familiar with. Matt Dryhurst and Holly Herndon of Interdependence, Daniel Keller, Carly Busta, and Lil Internet from New Models, our uh, collaborators, our squad in channel. Um, as well as Anna Katchian from Red Scare, A.P. Andy from the, Ant from the Antifada, and Jack Wagner from Other World. So that is, that is a relatively brief sketch of what I've been up to for the past five years. Um, I'm excited to say that we are making a documentary about this work, where we'll speak to young people behind the accounts and try to understand how the internet and politics are shaping their real lives alongside the 2024 elections. And in the meantime, you can find me, uh, well, if you're lucky, maybe on social media, but uh, I think probably Web 2.5, you know, Substack, Patreon is a, a better place because um, I, you know, pop up and disappear unpredictably on, uh, on Instagram. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of extra time. Maybe we can do uh, 10 minutes. We'll take a few quick questions for a QA. and a And um, yeah, thanks everybody for coming today. This was a real blast. That's a, yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I'll, I'll just, I'll reiterate. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the question is about uh, young people, teenagers flowing into political identities as opposed to music and whether this is a product of the political circumstances of the moment or a kind of technological artifact that is uh, incentivized or produced through social media. It's kind of my rephrasing of your question. And I would say that um, 
both of those things are actually present, and case by case, you can do, you know, is it 80-20 in this case, uh, in one direction, or is it 50-50? And part of the difficulty with the media narrative around these topics is that um, people attribute one causation instead of another. Um, I think it's absolutely necessary to say that there are certainly political topics that just thrive uh, in algorithmic feeds that incentivize controversy, drive engagement, and so on, and those things are massively amplified, disproportionately amplified. Um, but it's it's difficult to run with that critique because you then you run the risk of hand waving away the actual political crisis where you know these are people of this generation um, they don't have the same opportunities for upward mobility I mean we're, we are watching a serious expansion of the Overton window and I think there are actually some you know, pretty important things that are happening right now with the um, uh, you know, the chips act the inflation reduction act the uh, green deal in Europe that really represent um, a shift away from some of the uh, the, the neoliberal consensus Census around um, how political economies, you know, massive like nation state size political economies operate. So um, something is actually happening, you know, and I think in the period that we saw um, a relative depoliticization of Gen X and, uh, and the millennials, which I would categorize myself as this, um, it just wasn't as immediately apparent that there was anything you could do about it. You know, I don't, I don't think that's too pessimistic a statement because it, that just was the elite consensus across all the parties, but now you see things from you know the Republican side for an, extans an expansion of infrastructure spending and jobs creation, and um, you know this heterodox populism of J.D. Vance and Josh Hawley and all sorts of other people, Marco Rubio to a degree even, um, and you know they they shoehorn it in in a, in a weird way of like well we need to increase you know the the might of our our, our mighty nation and uh, military spending and so on, but they are talking about a form of Keynesianism that is really qualitatively different from those early debates of like, you know, what the nerds would call the uh, economic calculation debate in the 20th century of like uh, um, trying to organize the, an economy without the distortions of price signals that institutions create and weird cliffs in, in different markets and so on. So um, yeah, yeah, I think uh, there's it's a combination of the two. <laughs> uh, can we take maybe one or two more questions? Maybe I, back here. Zoomer was um, not necessarily successful as a influencer himself, but he was an adherent to a rather niche philosophy that sometimes blows up on the internet um, around particularly a few content creators like Caleb Maupin, who works for RT, that are a, um, a kind of unconventional brand of patriotic socialism or something like this. So you blend in kind of anti-imperialism with like weird nationalist identities, and they do have significant crossover with uh, forces that are more so aligned with like the far right. Uh, sometimes this is called fourth positionism. Um, this very quickly turns into a meme where people, you know, just they, they add positions to like make it more extreme. Um, but I think for Zoomer, what he kind of needed was basically to square who he was in the world and his lived experience and that very jarring disruption between what people say and what they do, right? We're all kind of like, there's a gap between the rhetoric and the actions, and this is part of what makes politics so insane right now. You know, like neoliberalism itself is a kind of niche political ideology. You know, you have all these contradictions rolled into it where it's like woke diversity, mass incarcerationism, and you have like rugged individualistic oligarchic bailout. Like all, all of those things are simultaneously active, but they're totally incongruent, and it's you know, people who are the blue check journalists with the official narrative have almost as much hypocrisy as some of these shit posting teenagers. Um, so I don't think that his brand was necessarily scalable. Uh, he has since gone off of social media for a lot of people who live their life through this newsfeed. That is a positive development in their personal life. And that sense of community um, and that kind of desire to, to role play and that world building impulse is largely satisfied through things like Dungeons and Dragons, uh, which is probably a better political outlet. And I mean, role playing games are a very useful way of sandboxing new types of societies. 
Um, I think of the Seasteading Institute uh, had a, a kind of role-playing game where you could opt into their Discord, and among them were the anarcho-capitalist, the worker cooperative, and then um, I, for, I forget the other one. Maybe it was like a, a, a venture capitalist, uh, something something else like that. But they are um, they are pretty useful exercise in expanding the Overton window. Um, yeah, but he he himself was not an especially influential content creator. We have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, Ruby? Yeah, yeah. That, um, so there's a, a question that I'll just uh, try to rephrase for everyone who maybe couldn't hear, but um, I think I phrase this in the book as like, what use is a political party of one? You know, and some of these ideologies are so niche. It's like, you're the only person who believes this incredibly long tail uh, idea. Like, how do you expect to band together a coalition? And I think you're kind of seeing two things happen at the same time, which is like young people trying on and off political identities, but then also like carving out a personal brand in the, the Web2 attention economy. Um, all of that said, Part of any political change, like neoliberalism has been the consensus ideology for you know a, a decades upon decades now. This begins, this was a really niche, you know, fringe belief in 1947 when the Mont Pelerin Society first gathered with Friedrich Hayek and Milton Friedman and so on. And these people were looked on as crazy lunatics that had, you know, unconventional ideas that were unpalatable and butted up against the, uh, the Keynesian consensus of that period. But, you know, 30 years, 30 plus years of lobbying their political ideas and entering into institutions completely remapped the way that we think of politics now, where the idea that nation states should conduct their economy in the way that you and I individually balance our checkbooks is, uh, it, that's a strange idea in 1947, but now that's how everyone thinks about it. So there's something about um, being right and going against consensus ideas that if you understand the value of an idea from early on, um, I think a lot of this in, certain, in terms of trend forecasting and analysis and, and commentary, like. A lot, this is part of my job now, is to just <laughs> patiently wait and then be proven correct. And, um, you know, if you have a good track record of that, um, then, you know, predictive capacity is ultimately the judge of all of these different ideas. So, ostensibly, there's someone out there right now who has an idea, um, things that become much larger in the next few years and didn't necessarily seem like they could even exist. You know, I would say that the rise of uh, that kind of this Trumpism, heterodox, right-wing populism seems incongruent, but now it's, it's totally working. And those were, you know, really, really fringe ideas just a few years ago. So things can move from being, you know, beyond the pale to very influential rather quickly, you know. Um, okay, we can do, I think, one more talk uh, up here in the front. Yeah, yeah, I would say, um, I'm, I'm just watching the time, so I'm going to respond rather than uh, rephrase, but uh, okay, so there's this massive like expansion of the Overton window. There are these opportunities within which, let's say there's a very successful hashtag campaign, and then there are niche philosophies that have been on the margins for a few years, and then have this explosive viral moment of visibility. Uh, within that, that presents an enormous opportunity for people who have... Um, a kind of political commitment that they've been looking to spread to people, and they've been in other decades, maybe the crazy guy screaming on the corner, uh, but now they've got a big megaphone and everyone's willing to listen. Um, and you saw this in the very early ages of the internet that libertarian think tanks, when a certain meme would blow up, they would contact the person who made it, they would fly them to speak, and they would leverage that following against their, they would literally bring them to their institutions to perform in some cases. Uh, and I think that is just across the board, where there's a moment for um, 
you know, uh, uh, different radicals to kind of seize the, the public sentiment and the political imagination of the moment. And um, yeah, I, I think that kind of comes back maybe to this, this earlier question of the political party of one is that um, political change is a, often a lifetime of something. And, you know, a lot of the news cycle that we're used to today, people get very wrapped up in these ideas that they've maybe held for like six months to a year or something like that, but now it totally defines them. We've all kind of seen this happen in our news feeds. But um, it really is this kind of like slow game of just, you know, 40 years of slowly thinking that this is correct, waiting for it to become valuable, and then looking for the right moment to seize those things. Um, and I would say that there's probably, uh, be very conscious of the time, so I'll try to summarize all of this, but um, some of these coalitions are too small to really stand on their own. And so what they do is they bundle a whole bunch of people together. So within, I had mentioned earlier some of these like, um, you know, paleoconservative ideas that they have like a Murray Rothbard kind of like, um, you know, a libertarian free market ideology. And then they also have like a Pat Buchanan kind of like conservative nationalism that requires firm borders to the state, a lot of state spending. And, you know, the libertarians are against those borders. The conservatives are for them. Uh, but they find themselves in the same political coalition, even though they have these incompatibilities. Eventually those things will cause coalitions to break apart, but in the meantime, they do need to bundle together. So you saw a lot of people who were, you know, of this ethno-separatist variety, just like platform a whole bunch of other radical people. And in the scale of the impact of this stuff, it's, it's probably important to uh, remember that in, you know, 20, I think 2016, that the kill stream with Richard Spencer was quantitatively the largest watched live stream on YouTube. Like, that's fucking enormous. That's a fucking enormous uh, amount of influence and reach. So I, I think we're just kind of watching this kind of slow uh, bleed out of all of those ideas and kind of learning what this alternative media system really was, um, and that there was a reason why we had gatekeepers and editors to begin with. Yeah, yeah. So uh, don't try to save legacy media, but uh, don't don't put all of your eggs in the alternative media basket either. Yeah. Thanks everybody for coming. This is a blast. Yeah.